Hi, and welcome to Creating Ethical and Sustainable, Sustainable Business, Chapter 4. Um, in this chapter, we're going to be looking at um, ethical decision making and some descriptive ethical theories. So let's get started and have a look at this and we'll be um, moving forward. All right, so making decisions in business ethics, descriptive ethical theories. Um, in chapter four, we will be doing some overview of how we actually break this down and tease it apart. So we'll be looking at the reasoning of ethical and unethical decisions made in the workplace. We'll also review some um, a decision making model and we'll be pulling that apart in terms of situational factors and also individual influences. So we start to shape those ethical decision makings and we're going to be working with that model. We'll also be looking at those issues, the context, um, with those situ situational influences and points of leverage for making and improving. So optimizing how you can um, make better decisions, make more ethical decisions in business, particularly as managers and leaders, up and coming managers and leaders. So let's have a look at descriptive business ethic theories. And um, we start out with a definition. So we seek to describe how ethical decisions are made in business and what influences the process and outcomes of those decisions. So it's always a really good idea to start out with a clear definition so we all know that what we're talking about. So it gives us a base to go from. So this is a definition of descriptive business ethical theories from your textbook. So in part one, we're going to look at the main factors in um, in having setting ourselves up for the the situation and looking at through that moral lens where we can create some we can tie in some ethical theories and make optimize our ethical decision making. So when we make decisions in business, it has really big impacts on others. Okay. And this can be influenced by um, the, the individual and situational factors. And this um, actually impacts how we characterize our choices, our options, and possible alternative courses of action that might be open to our decision-making process. So lots of perceptions in um, how we, how we um, bring in those different stakeholders, those different parties, how that impacts it, how we actually bring them into the decision-making process as well, will be part of that ethical decision process that we'll discuss. Okay, this is a lovely model that, that helps us break down and I'm just gonna get my pointer happening here. And, okay. So when we start to break down the model here, we've got, um, this is a fundamental model to ethical decision making, quite a classical one that we can build on and we can also look at it throughout this, um, this chapter and this topic. So the stages in this, this ethical decision making is that you, you see that there's an issue, okay, there's a problem, we're recognizing that there's some ethical dilemmas in here, it might challenge your thinking, you might start to question, you know, is that really right or is it wrong? And then we proceed to making a moral judgment, okay, on whether possibly we need to get some other thoughts in there. We might also be starting to think, yes, it's right or, or it's wrong, okay? So then we establish a moral intent, okay? So what's our goal, what's our aims? And then how do we actually engage in that moral behavior and bring in that decision-making? Sorry about that little bounce forward there. So to do this, we um, start to look at the relationship with normative theory. So normative theory gives us some um, processes to that relation of moral judgment. So it's primarily in relation to moral judgment, the normative theories. 
And this is, this is where we start to link in rights, duties, consequences. And those rights, duties and consequences that you see here are linking back to some of those theories that we've already introduced. Um, when we're, as business managers and leaders, we quite often rely on consequential as thinking. So what are the impacts? What are the consequences that are going to be the output of our decision? And then we also, that relationship here with normative theory is whether or how normative theory is used by an individual decision maker or we start to look at um, a range of factors that might impact or influence um, that decision making process. So there's some limitations of ethical decision making models. So what I'd like to emphasize here is that no one size fits all, okay? Now the, the model that we're looking at today, it does give us as a basis to build on. OK, so it's a fairly easy one to understand. However, there are limitations when we start to look at things in a very linear process and also um, where people have created models and perhaps it doesn't fit particular um, context or particular decision. OK, so models are useful. All right, well, we need to remember that models are useful to help us to break down and often as a starting point and to start to see um, some of the, the different aspects, the different factors that come into play in that decision. OK, um, a model is intended not as a definitive representation, so not that one size fits all for that ethical decision making. However, it gives us a basis or as fairly as this slide says, a fairly simple way to present a complex process. So it's a good starting point. Limitations of ethical decision making models. Um, often you'll find that your, your problem is not straightforward and it needs to be broken down into smaller parts. Um, there's often lots of different stages and complexities and they may be interdependent on other situations, other people, other organisations. There can also be some national or cultural biases that come into play, particularly if you're dealing with um, a globalised situation. So I'd like to stop here, or I'd like you guys to pause here and think of a decision you made recently. It could be something fairly easy like a retail purchase. Um, for example, um, I was buying some lotion the other day and I definitely had some of these um, factors coming into how ethical my decision was in my purchase. So that purchase, I was looking at what, how that product was made, where it was made, what are the ingredients, how were those ingredients sourced. So when we think about some of those decisions, even simple decisions, what were the impacts? Were there alternatives? How did you come upon your decision? And a retail purchase gives us a really good, um, simple approach to start to think about this. So think about something you've bought recently and what were the impacts and possibly did you look at alternatives? So we'll come back to this in just a minute and we'll start part two. So see you in a See you after you've noted some ideas down. OK, welcome back to part two, influences on decision making. So here we're going to be looking at individual factors and situational factors. OK, now according, this is a very general view, but the individual factors um, are strongly related to North American and Asian bias, and that's consistent within constraints. So um, that choice has constraints upon it, all right? Whereas the European view, um, which is more about situational, is more concerned for those constraints for themselves. So there's two broad categories when we look at the influences on ethical decision-making that we'll be looking at. 
and they are individual factors which are more characteristic so they they come with you as a person from birth and um they're also your your experiences and um what you your socialization so your family um your community those sort of things that impact you as an individual and then the second one is situational factors so this particularly comes in with your work context some of the pressures that might come in um, the culture of your work it also might be that intensity of that decision making um, that can be in terms of um, the impacts it can also be in terms of the timing so that ethical framing starts to formulate there particularly in situational factors where your individual also comes in to what's ethical and unethical in that decision. So this gives you, we go back to the model. Okay, so we've got this same model that we looked at in part one. And now we start to look at individual factors and how they influence every part of this process. So right through the stages, OK, and then we also start to look at the situational factors and the, how they come into play with that decision making process. So individual factors, quite a few here. We've got age and gender, some of your national and cultural characteristics, education, employment, your psychological factors with cognitive moral de development. So that thinking of how you've actually developed your morals. Um, your locus control, where it can be where you, you look to yourself for some of those um, reasonings, or you actually see the um, quite often that locus control, if it's external, it can be coming from those more environmental factors. Your personal values, your personal integrity, and also your moral imagination. I smile at that word moral imagination because I think it's... Um, I don't know, it just has a really nice ring to it. And it's for me, it brings in um, to that decision making where you really start to consider other um, ways. So let's break this down a little bit and we'll have a look at a few of these. So first of all, we're going to look at age and gender. So um, these are general generalized ideas that age has um, some impact. However, if you think about it, you know, decisions that you might have made in your 20s versus your 50s will probably be different. It'll be, um, it'll be dependent a lot more on your experiences. It might also be dependent on some of the changes that have happened throughout your life. Um, when we look at gender, we start to think about some of those individual characteristics that are researched. Um, Gender is still a huge issue. Some of those impacts that might influence us in our decision making, for example, gender pay gaps, you know, that that um, pay gap with gender is still very relevant in how we, um, how Western worlds operate. Um, just remember that these, some of these categories are quite simplistic because they don't take into account a, a bigger picture. But Definitely age and gender um, come into play those individual factors, what point you are in your life and also your gender. Really influences how you problem solve and you make decisions. So national and cultural characteristics, um, and you'll see here like when it comes to gender, this also comes into play here with masculinity and femininity. And we're drawing on Hofstede's theory, theory here where um, those national and cultural characteristics, for example, with individualism and collectivism, um, Australia, North America, um, we're known as a more individual, individualistic um, cultural characteristics. So we think more about um, what's in it for me. That's, that's a very simple way of putting it. Whereas the European view is more a collectivist. So it's more, how how is that going to you know it's more about the community and society okay um these points here of Hofstede's um 
are very unique in that they um, were developed in the 70s, 80s, and a very unique situation where it was one organisation but across about 70 nations. So it developed a, a really interesting way to look at some of those char cultural characteristics. Um, however, remember, it is fairly simplistic. We can't put everybody into that same um, category. Not everybody will fit. Uh, after Hofstede developed these, these characteristics, he also brought in where I've just put this arrow, long-term versus short-term orientation. And interesting enough, when we start to look at um, sustainability, um, there's quite... The, the shareholder approach is more of a short-term orientation versus a stakeholder approach um, and a sustainable approach is more of a long-term um, orientation. So when we look at education employment, if we think about the, the ranking of institutions, universities, um, you know, if you're um, being educated in a highly ranked university, um, that might have a different sway on how you perceive things compared to a lower ranked one. Also, the level of education that you get, you know, that type and that quality can really come into play. So it's not to say that, that somebody who has less education isn't going to be a, a deep thinker or um, be knowledgeable. However, people who are in a learning mode and that's probably a better way to say it, is the learning mode uh, will probably have broader views of the world and um, will be have a, a better understanding of some of the consequences and impacts through that, that broader learning. Employment also, okay? Um, and here we go into um, business education and how it reinforces the myth of business as amoral. So it's that oxymoron of business and ethics. Can business be ethical? And we have discussed this already, and it's something that I'd like you to think about. Um, and we're in a changing world where the possibilities are coming into play. So psychological factors, okay? So there's different levels of re reasoning um, that we apply as individuals to our ethical issues and our problems. And this can depend um, on our levels of cognitive ability. So that might come into education, it might be a genetic thing, um, and it, you know, there, there's quite, again, it's a theory, cognitive moral development, and there's, um, we'll go into that in the next slide a little bit, and I'd like you to delve into, delve into all of these factors a little bit more, um, particularly the ones that, that speak to you. So um, there's some criticisms of cognitive moral development, particularly the gender bias, um, those inherent value judgments that we make as individuals, and also the, the lack of variance in stages. So an individual's locus of control also determines, sorry, we just did a little bit of an oopsie there. So locus of control, also comes into play. So quite often um, I'm going to reflect on this because um, I've got somebody who's very close to me who has an external locus of control. So for example, they often don't, when something goes wrong, they don't look to how um, they might improve. They don't look to how they might um, have handled that better or in the future, how they might actually um, respond to that situation or handle that situation better. So, for example, um, you know, if somebody has lost a lot of money in a bad investment, then they, they might blame it on the bank or the advice that they were given. They didn't actually look to themselves to think about, well, did I get all the facts there? Um, did I jump into it too early? So that's an external locus of control, yet somebody with an internal locus of control will start to think, oh, my God, what did I do? You know, how can I make that better um, in the future? How can I make better investments? 
who can I who can I bring in to to help me? How can I better manage that that um, decision making? So these I won't go into these in too much detail, but it goes into all the levels, the three levels of cognitive moral development, which are pre conventional, conventional, and post conventional. So I encourage you to have a look at these. Um, and it's quite interesting how we go through those stages. And remember, these are theories. One size doesn't fit all, but it helps us to, to break down and understand um, that cognitive moral de development and what stages that theory comes into play. So have a look at these. And I, as I said, your textbook goes into it um, in detail. These slides have been um, cut down somewhat to, to create a more a, a briefer um, presentation of the theory. So personal values, integrity and moral and imagination. Remember we're talking about ethical decision making here and those individual factors that come into play. So our personal values, it's pretty pretty reasonable that our personal values are going to come into play when we make ethical decisions. So those personal or social preferences um, that, you know, might we might have our own moral codes that might be actually coming into play and impacting that decision making. Our integrity, those principles and values. And so sorry about this, it keeps jumping. OK, those principles or values that um, we, we actually believe in, OK, our personal integrity. And then this final one of moral imagination, and that's where we start to look into some of the possibilities, that variety of possibilities and those moral consequences. So we, we, to me, that's about making more of a pool of ideas and really um, and you quite often might encourage conversations with others like discourse ethics might come into moral imagination where you're starting to to challenge some of your views and um, look at those possible issues consequences and solutions that um, Patricia Werhain, um is talking about with moral imagination so I'd like you to pause here and let's think about that purchase that we discussed in part one and what are some of the individual factors that influence this decision? Uh, part three will be going into situational factors. However, here, think about those individual factors that came into play. And um, we're talking about your age, your gender, um, and things like education, employment. Okay, so take a few minutes and jot down some ideas and we'll be back for part three. All right, part three, situational influences on our ethical decision making. Cute little photograph here of the situational awareness of the cat and the bird. I think both of them are very aware of what's actually happening in their context and their situation. Um, and I like that, that phrase, some lessons can only be learned once. <laughs> All right, so situational influences on decision making. We've got quite a few here um, in terms of that moral intensity where it's um, it's that intensity that, that um, I guess intensity when we're talking about um, the impacts, the influences of those issues and how it might be related. And then that, that next one is moral fr framing. And my apologies again, I'll try and stop doing that. But with moral intensity, moral framing, where we start to look at some of those aspects on that decision making and how we actually put that into a context, okay? So that moral awareness on how we actually frame those decision making. Then we've got context, so we've got rewards. What's in it for you? You know, what's, what's the reward or the punishment in terms of that ethical decision? Um, authority, okay, 
Um, we've got bureaucracy. So that level of um, bureaucracy, the, the, the red tape that comes into play. The roles, who whose role, you know, where you sit in the hierarchy of that organisation, your organisational culture. So what's the myths, the legends that are actually placed around your organisational culture? And then on a higher level, we've got that national context. So some of those things that um, come into play in terms of our national context. So if you're operating as an individual from another um, culture and coming to an organisation that might have some different um, cultures in terms of how we perceive things of what's right and wrong as a country as well. Okay, so moral intensity, the magnitude of those consequences, um, so that that depth of those consequences, how how broad reaching are they? The social consensus. So what's those those normative thinking? The normative thinking of your society will come into play in terms of that intensity as well. And the potential of the effect, how much effect is going to happen? And that temporal immediacy where that, that time factor comes into play. So that moral intensity can be very much impacted by a timeliness of that decision, how quickly it needs to be made. And then the proximity, how close it is, you know, how how personal that is, how um, the impact that moral intensity in terms of proximity to perhaps possibly your community, your society, your business, and you as an individual. And then that all comes down into a concentration of effect as well. So if we break down moral framing, um, it comes into some of how it's how it's actually framed in terms of language. Uh, quite often problems or situations can be very swayed by how people situate them and in terms of the language they use in framing those issues. So and that can also um, impact how we think about it morally as well. So if we have a problem, for example, um, somebody actually makes a lie, you know, they, they actually lie about something. Um, for example, I was in a meeting um, about a year ago and somebody um, of influence and power told me they would not be applying for a particular role. And on that, and they gave me their reasons, how they didn't consider themselves to be um, have the right skill set for that leadership role, etc. Okay, so I made decisions on how I was proceeding according to how they pitched that. However, when it came to um, they actually did apply for that particular role, and so the language that they use, they never actually came out and said they wouldn't be going for that role, but the language they used around it was indicating that they weren't suitable, um, it wasn't their thing, yet um, they did that. So they framed that in a certain way which led my beliefs to take me on a certain path. And I guess that, that links in nicely to moral muteness too. So um, because when we have moral muteness, we might be listening to a situation or involved in a situation where harmony, efficiency and come into play. So we want to keep the peace, okay? We, we don't want to rock the boat, so we might have that moral muteness where we go against our personal values to keep the peace. We might also go against what we consider right or wrong for efficiency, okay? to make sure that something happens fairly speedily or timely um, or easily. And then we have power and effectiveness. So this last point here of power and effectiveness where um, through our moral muteness, we might be propping up somebody else's power, a leader, a boss, and their effectiveness or we might be also supporting and, and bolstering our own power or effectiveness through keeping quietness, quiet 
yet it goes against our, our personal morals. So ethical decisions are rationalised and justified through certain tactics. Um, please go through this and have a quick look. Um, I'm not going to go through each one in detail because I think it's probably best if you absorb these yourself because there's a lot to take in here. Um, let's just have a look at one in, and we'll look at denial of injury. So we've got on the, the strategy how we actually categorise these denial of responsibility, denial of injury, victim, social weighting, appeal to higher loyalties and metaphor of the ledger. So denial of injury, um, when we start to think, well, no one was really harmed. So that moral mutinous come into play here because if, um, if I keep quiet and I don't sort of speak up, and voice my, my moral concerns, then what does it matter? Because no one was really harmed, okay? The other one I really like is metaphor of the ledger. Another cute little phrase. And it's when people justify, okay? So it might be because, um, for example, you might decide that it's okay to take um, some equipment home from work and you, the metaphor of the ledger would be because you're going to balance it with, well, I'm going to be working at home. However, company policy says that you shouldn't take resources home. It might be also in the case, and I know that, um, you know, a lot of people that I work with and possibly myself, <laughs> when we, we sort of go, okay, well, I work into the evening, therefore I can sleep in in the morning. So we're balancing our, um, our social conscious in terms of how much we put into the organisation and what they owe back. So that's a metaphor of the ledger. We're balancing that ledger and justifying it. Systems of rewards, okay. Um, it's an adherence to ethical princi principles and standards. Um, that has less chance of being repeated and spread throughout a company when it goes unnoticed and unrewarded. So um, a systems of reward is what's right in the corporation is not always right in a man's home or his, his church. So sometimes when we what, what happens in the workplace might not be the same values or moral standards as what we actually have at home. Authority and bureaucracy, um, authority where, you know, people do what you're told to do or what you think is the right thing to do. You're being told to do it, okay? So that authority is a justification. So if you're in a, this quite happens when there's positions of power and um, power that your leader, your boss is actually, um, you're perceiving that that's what you what they want you to do, or they're telling you that you actually need to do be doing something. However, it might not sit well with you. Um, bureaucracy, so that suppression of moral autonomy. Okay, when there's lots of red tape, quite often we we can't actually wade through it. It might wear us down, and so that suppresses our values and that autonomy of how we actually make decisions. Um, it can be also instrumental morality, so that bureaucracy, it sort of seemed to be moral and that distancing. So because of bureaucracy, um, bureaucracy quite often puts a barrier between um, making things perfect world. And then that denial of moral stat status, because we've got that bureaucracy and all that red tape, lots of forms possibly. And so it's um, that you, you're pushing it away, you're distancing yourself, or you're denying that you have any moral status in that decision making. So work roles and organisation norms and culture. So your work role really can um, be um, fundamental to how you actually um, get involved in ethical decision making. And this is where organisational norms and culture always come into play as well. So those group norms that, that actually 
um, create acceptable standards of behaviour within your work community. So it might be, for example, the way you dress, okay? So if there's a standardised um, dress code, okay, quite often dress codes are not actually formalised. However, for example, in a legal organisation, um, a code of dress might be that you are wearing business suits, okay? You're very professional looking. Whereas if you're working in a restaurant, um, your norm and culture might be that it's okay to wear shorts and a t-shirt, you're working in a cool groovy cafe, and that's a code of dress. Whereas a business suit going to work in that cool and groovy cafe would not be, um, you know, you'd be out of, you'd be out of the norm there. So some of those those um, things that you see and you hear, the language that you use is another thing that comes into play very key these days with um, your organisational norms and culture. For example, at university, we use lots of acronyms. For example, Griffith Business School. Nobody ever says Griffith Business School. We all just talk within our institution and say GBS. Okay, national and cultural context. Um, the individual making of the decision, instead of looking at the nationality from the individual making the decision, we start to look at the nation in terms of the decision maker's nationality. So where you come from. And we start to not look at the, um, for example, if somebody comes from a particular culture, you might assume, you might sort of say, oh, that's what they always do. So there's an assumption there that um, they have those sort of standards as well. Um, different cultures um, will mostly have different views of what is right and wrong. Even in Western cultures, will vary in terms of what is right and wrong. Um, just look to the United States versus Australia with some of the issues. Um, I mentioned abortion the other in previous slides, and I'm not meaning to be controversial here, but that sort of highlights some of those differences of what is considered right and wrong. So to summarise, um, before we go into our final discussion point, we have discussed stages of decision making as a business model. Um, we've also looked at individual and situational factors that come into ethical decision making. And um, I really encourage you to go into depth, particularly in this chapter, and have a look at some of those um, parts. You, you won't need to know verbatim um, all the different individual and situational factors. However, I encourage you to engage and get a grasp of what, what some of them are. And some of them will speak to you more than others. So our final discussion point for this lecture, I want you to still think about that purchase, but now think about those situational influences on that purchase. What were they? How did they impact you? OK, um, and just have a have a deep think about that in terms of those situational influences and jot down some notes, take some. Um, take away your thoughts and have a think about it and start to really understand those individual and situational factors and how they might actually impact your decision making. Thanks for joining me and I look forward to seeing you in the next topic.